Do you know the city like a lover? Have you ever wondered how much Glasgow has changed since we first met Chief Inspector Taggart? Get your name. Taggart. Huh? First name. Chief Inspector. <laughs> Chief. <laughs> Find out now in this episode of Astonishing Glasgow. The television show Taggart first hit our screens on September the 6th, 1983, with its great theme tune sung by Maggie Bell that I can't play on my video for copyright reasons. The title character was played by Mark McManus right up until his death in 1994. It's hard to believe that in episode 1 he's only 49. That's just two years older than I am now. Morning, sir. When we first meet Jim Taggart on the show, he's wearing this great dressing gown. Or is it a house coat? Let me know what you call it down in the comments, as I've got a family argument to win with Mrs Astonishing Glasgow. Now that I've restarted that argument, it's time to start the tour. It's Sunday the 7th of April 2024, and for Easter Sunday in Glasgow, the weather is far better than expected. My plan in this video is to visit as many Taggart locations from the pilot episode and from series 1 as I can find, and I'll do it in a continual tour of the city. That means I won't be visiting the locations in the order that they appear in the show, but I'll put the episode number on the screen for reference each time I show a clip. I just hope STV don't murder this video for me using clips from the show, and a small warning, there may be spoilers ahead if you've never watched Taggart. I live in the south side of the city, so my route starts crossing Glasgow Green and the first of our Taggart locations is right here on St Andrew's Suspension Bridge over the Clyde. This scene is from episode 4, when Taggart's sidekick Peter Livingston is having a heart to heart with his partner. At least now you know. In the background, you can just make out the home of George Parsonage. George spent 40 years rescuing people from the river. He took over the post from his dad Benny in the 1950s. There's a really nice plaque to Benny and his wife at the entrance to the green. And between George, Benny and the volunteers at the Glasgow Humane Society, thousands of people have been saved from drowning in the River Clyde. George retired in 2019 and he passed the task on to William Graham. The Glasgow Humane Society still rescue people from this jetty in the river. To get to the next location, we cross Glasgow Green, and then I'm out on the city streets, and I'm not brave enough to try and navigate the city with one hand on the handlebars and one hand holding the camera. So I'll see you at the next location when it's safe to hold a camera again. It's about two and a half miles uphill from the green to the brand new Sight Hill Bridge, and I'm joining the Forth and Clyde Canal for a short journey to Spears Wharf. This view features in episode 5. Port Dundas was a terminus of the Forth and Clyde Canal, but with the decline in canal traffic, it was completely derelict by the 1980s. This is how we see Alan Cumming, yes, that Alan Cumming, climbing out of the window of the Harbour Master's house. It wasn't long after Taggart was filmed here that the warehousing was transformed into luxury flats and the cottage was restored. Now we're starting to head towards the spiritual home of Taggart in Mary Hill. And for this, the canal bank is absolutely perfect. It's so perfect in fact, that the Mary Hill motorway was proposed in 1965, which would have completely filled in the canal to make space for a four lane motorway heading west. You can find out more about that on the great Scottish Road Archive website, I'll leave a link in the description below. About two more miles along the canal, not quite as far as Firhill Stadium, the home of Partick Thistle Football Club, is a brand new bridge over the river and a brand new nature reserve. More importantly, on this side of the canal, there's a brand new path down what was just a grassy slope in 1984. At the bottom of the slope, 
on the gusher of Garscube Road and Furhill Road was where the Furhill Tavern stood as seen in Taggart Episode 3. It doesn't play a big role in this episode, but I did have to pass it on the way to another location that I am amazed is still there. This location takes a bit of finding, and quite a bit has changed since Taggart filmed here 40 years ago. Following Furhill Road to the front door of the stadium, look the other direction into Springbank Street, and you still won't see the Taggart location. For this, you need to go about 100 metres down Springbank Street, and then up into the bin lane, and then look up. The mural from 1983 is still there on the gable end. I have tried to get information on who painted this and when, but I've hit a bit of a dead end. All I can find is this picture credited to Felipe Charrier from 1981, so it's amazing that this mural has survived for at least 43 years. In the Taggart scene filmed here, the guy with the camera watches Douglas Sanakin, who played Billy in Gregory's Girl, try and rob a phone box on North Park Street before he then stabs the man from British Telecom. It was all open waste ground in 1983, but it's all built up now, so you can't see North Park Street from the same location, and I cannot confirm if the phone box or that graffiti is still there. I've got no idea how they got away with showing that on telly in the 80s. Back up onto the canal to continue our tour, and we're heading to the Kelvin Docks about a mile and a half away. On the way there, I think this might have been the location of a body found in episode 1. It's hard to tell, as the buildings on the right have completely changed, but the curve in the canal matches, and the buildings on the left are very similar. Add to that that it's just off Ruckel Street, so the location has easy access for filming equipment, so I think it might just have been here. This cycle path really is a great route. I've been cycling here for the past 10 or 15 years and just recently they added a brand new park, a huge new bridge and the Bethia, a mythical Scottish serpent. It's almost as mythical as my blue knees, which don't usually come out this early in the year, but it's so unusual for Easter Sunday to be warm. I grabbed the opportunity to soak in as much vitamin D as possible. I really hope this weather doesn't change. A short ride up to the Maryhill Locks, and if you want to know more about them, check out episode 32 of Astonishing Glasgow, because for now, we're looking for a collection of episode 4 locations just off Maryhill Road. Episode 4, titled Knife Edge, opens with this view of Maryhill Road, then pans around to this small cottage, which is still there, through the trees and the fences behind the Kelvin Dock pub. The cottage stood pretty much by itself in 1983. If we head up level to the cottage, looking at the screenshots from Taggart, it appears that this road wasn't even here in 1983. In fact, even today it doesn't have a name on Google Maps, it just appears to be an access road for the flats on Cumlodden Drive. Now I don't want to give any spoilers, but Alex Norton lives in this house in the episode, and if you know your Taggart history, he took the lead role of DCI Matt Burke in 2002, even though he was the murderer in this episode. I kind of wonder if the people living here now know what was once in the bathtub in their garage. So this next location took a lot of finding. It's only about a mile away from the Kelvin Dock, but to find its precise location, I had to tap into my inner Taggart. The quest now takes me to the Kelvindale area of Glasgow, and an unassuming residential street called Balcarries Avenue. The house at 112 Balcarries Avenue is the home of the very first murder victim of the show, Aileen Valentine. We see Taggart and Peter arrive at the house, and go through the gate to break the news to the victim's parents. Do you 
want to break it. And the way I found this location was from this establishing shot. I worked out that those tower blocks are the Winford High Flats in Mary Hill. I then had to work out at what angle we needed to be in to be able to see them in this position. Lots of searching on Google Maps led me to Balcaris Avenue. With all the trees and the bushes, you can hardly see Winford High Flats from here at all now, and as they're about to be demolished, they will soon be gone forever. It's lucky then that the next location is right below the flats, and we're going to get to visit them before they disappear. This might just be one of the most important scenes in Taggart history. In the bushes, just over this fence is where the body of Aileen Valentine, the very first murder victim of the very first show, was found. Strangled with a ligature. We don't have ligatures in Mary Hill. Uh, sorry Jim. It's hard to see in the show, and it's just as hard to see in real life. But look closely, and you can see the arches of an old railway bridge through the bushes, confirming the location, and maybe there should be a plaque here to Eileen Valentine on the fence. Hmm. Now the real giveaway that we're in the right location is all the shots of the high flats in the background. Another surviving feature from 1983 is the chain link fence in these two fence posts. Again, not giving away any spoilers, but Gerard Kelly features prominently in this episode and his character lives in the tower blocks. So in the show we get this view from right below 171 Winford Road. This is as close as I can get now, with all the fencing in the way, and to be honest, I don't want to get any closer given the state of the building. I'm going to visit one more location today and then head home. I've been cycling about for four hours so far, so I'm ready to go home, but I don't have very far to go to get to this next location. It's a little bit further along the Kelvin walkway to a patch of grass that's still in view of the Winford Flats. The actors Alan Cumming and Julie Graham are seen canoodling right here in episode five, with the old Mary Hill Railway viaduct in the background. The viaduct features heavily in episode 5, when later on, the police swoop in to arrest Alan Cummings' character on the bridge, and it doesn't end well for him. Access to the bridge is completely blocked off now with razor wire and brambles, so I couldn't visit the exact location of Alan's demise. Sorry, spoiler alert. I've now covered nearly 20 miles and have more than 6 miles cycling to get home. So I'm going to finish part 1 of the tour at the footbridge behind the Botanic Gardens. All being well, the good weather will hold and we'll start part 2 of this Taggart tour right here tomorrow. So keep watching. While I head home for dinner and a Redox bath, please hit that like and subscribe button if you're enjoying my videos. Remember to check out the Astonishing Glasgow merch shop to pick up a t-shirt, hoodie, hat, badge or sticker, it will help me make more episodes of Astonishing Glasgow. I've had my rest and I'm ready to go. So it's day two of tracking down Taggart locations and I'm in Queen's Park at the top end of Victoria Road. This is where Mark McManus lived up until his death in 1994 and I have it on good authority that he would often have a drink in the Queen's Park Cafe. I'm using Glasgow's new cycle path network to get to the city centre, cross the Clyde and then onwards to the Botanic Gardens where I threw the towel in yesterday, but on the way we can check off another couple of locations. This view under the Kingston Bridge appears in episode 6, The Killing Philosophy. There's a place on the other side. And you say you know Glasgow. And that's not its only claim to fame. Right here is where Renton steals a car battery in the film Train Spotting. A bit further along the Clyde, and they're fishing a dead body from the river in episode 2, Dead Ringers. These steps are quiet and unused now, but at one point thousands of people would have walked up and down these stairs each day to board the pedestrian ferry to cross the Clyde. 
This was the boarding point for the Stob Cross Ferry, and as well as the steps for the passenger ferry, you can see the ramps for the old vehicle ferry just up the river. The vehicle ferry was quite an unusual looking thing. It had a deck that could be raised or lowered to meet the quay wall, depending on the height of the tide. And these remaining ramps would then raise or lower to meet the deck of the ferry, so that the cars could be unloaded. One place that didn't exist in 1983 was the SECC, or the Scottish Events Campus as it's now known. I need to dodge through here and use the tunnel at the back of the hydro to get up to Finiston on my way to the Botanic Gardens. I'm going via Kelvin Grove Park, so before I go into Kelvin Grove Park, these gates on Derby Street can be seen in episode 2. And then inside the park, this footbridge across the River Kelvin is also featured in episode 2, Dead Ringer. The good news is that I'm now on the park, and I don't need to ride on the road again until I leave the Botanic Gardens. I do still have to get there first, but... Finally, we're back at the bridge where we finished up yesterday, in the location of the very first opening scene of Episode 1 of Taggart. The jogger who discovered the first body in Episode 1 is seen jogging past the end of this bridge, before he goes on to discover the body at the Windford Flats. If you know the Kelvin walkway though, you will know that he is actually jogging away from Mary Hill at this point, but that's the magic of telly. The bridge makes another appearance in episode 1, when Peter's seen chasing the murder suspect Billy, who's played by Vincent Friel. Does Vincent Friel seem familiar to you? Well he's popped up many things. He played Diane's dad in Trainspotting, he played the Wolfman in Restless Natives, and he even managed to appear again in an episode of Taggart in 1994. Now to get to the bridge, Billy had to run down these steps, which unfortunately means I'm now going to have to climb these steps with my bike. Great fun. top of the steps and we're at the back of the Kibble Palace in Glasgow's Botanic Gardens. The Kibble Palace has been here since 1873, but the Botanic Gardens have been on this site since 1842. It's really nice to get warm inside the glass house today, as it's a lot colder outside than yesterday. I really regret wearing shorts today. I wish this channel was called Astonishing Honolulu and I could be tracking down locations from Magnum PI. But there you go, you live with what you're given. We see Taggart and Peter arrive to talk to Billy, but as soon as he sees them, he bolts. Back out into the cold, and I need to cycle down Byers Road, so I'm definitely not doing that one-handed. I'll see you at the bottom. At the bottom of Byers Road is Partick Cross, and this area has been used in a few more TV shows and films. This is where the Volcano Nightclub was in Trainspotting. It's where the Double Glazing Office was in a BBC show called Taking Over the Asylum. And around the corner in Partick Bridge Street is where the Swing Park was seen in the 1980 film Death Watch. This same Swing Park can be seen behind the Gondola Bar in Episode 1 of Taggart. Now completely redeveloped, and the gondola is now the rickshaw. In Taggart episode 1, the gondola bar was Jim Taggart's local pub, and it was a bit on the rough side, which is why Peter decides to leave his school scarf in the bin at the door. The saddest change to happen in this street since 1983 only took place in 2021, 
when the St Simons Parish Church, which dated back to 1858, was destroyed in an arson attack. The remains are for sale now, so it will probably not be here for much longer. Now Taggart's Drinking Den at the Gondola was supposed to be the local pub for Maryhill Police Station, but it's two miles from Maryhill. Good job then that the Maryhill Police Station in the world of Taggart is only a third of a mile away, right here on Anderson Street in Partick. This building on Anderson Street now houses the Glasgow Health and Social Care Partnership and the RNIB radio studios, but in the 1980s I believe it was a rehearsal room owned by STV, so it was an obvious choice to use for Taggart. Even more fittingly, this was originally Partick Police Station in court, so it was perfectly cast as Taggart's Police Station, even though it's not in Mary Hill. From round the back of the building, you can even see the bars and the cell windows from its days as a cop shop. I'm continuing west from South Street and I'm joining the National Cycle Route 7, which in total is 500 miles long and runs from Sunderland to Inverness, but I'm only going a mile down towards White Inch. This part of the cycle route is built on the track bed of the Lanarkshire and Dumbartonshire Railway, which closed in 1964. You can now ride the track bed all the way to Clyde Bank, and in a few places you can still see the platforms of the old railway stations, like right here where Scotston East Station once stood. The only bit of the station building that remains is the bottom of the ceramic urinals and the gents' toilet. Amazing to think that trains once stopped right here, but that's not helping me with my Taggart location quest. For that I need to go to the next bridge in the line at Harland Street, where we get this view in episode 2 of the rover pulling into the lane behind the cottages. The cottages are still there, just off South Street, and they don't look to have changed very much, although they are now painted black and white as if they came from Tudor times. This was kind of a long way to come for a not very important filming location, but these cottages have always kind of intrigued me, and if you're going to do a job, do it properly. Right, I started this day cold, and it's only got colder, so on with the mission. With the power of editing, I have now trundled a mile down South Street and into the Glasgow Harbour development. This was the site of the Meadowside Granary building. It was the biggest brick built structure in Europe when it was here, and at 13 storeys tall, with no windows, it still managed to have more soul than the flats they've built on its site. The Granary buildings were demolished in 2002, and a couple of Taggart episodes were filmed here before its demolition. It was usually here they came when they had to fish bodies out of the Clyde, just like this scene in episode 5, when the bodies were in the boot of a Talbot Horizon. In episode 6, when they were on the hunt for a killer with a crossbow, the police cars all pull up here on the quayside. Most of the thorn wood, green dust on the envelope, if ever two and two made four. Another scene from episode 1 was filmed right here, but it was at the other end of the walkway. And you guessed it, it was another body being fished out the River Clyde. This time though it was discovered by a group of small boys playing on the waste ground, which was once D&W Henderson's shipyard. I couldn't match the exact location on this visit, but when I was here about 10 years ago the blue fence had blown down, and I managed to get this picture from almost exactly the same place. There's a gap there, in the fence, and as tempting as it seems, I'm not that stupid. I'm going to stay on this side of the safety fence. Being right beside the river means that I'm really cold now, but I'm also really stubborn, so I'm not giving up, and I hope you haven't given up watching. Stupid question really is that if you have given up watching, you won't hear the question. But anyway, I need to get to Springburn now, which is about 5 miles away, so let's get going. My route brings me past the Mitchell Library, and at the back of the Mitchell Library is the Mitchell Theatre entrance. And here it is in a shot from episode 3, Murder in Season. Our next stop is about two blocks away, 
and Charing Cross, and it's at the Cameron Memorial Fountain, where Peter questions two hoodlums hanging about outside the public toilets. I could have done with those toilets being open, and great, now I'm thinking about needing a toilet. Sight Hill, here I come. Police, the boy, which way did he go? Banana. Cheers. I've made it all the way to Sight Hill and my legs are dying, as well as two camera batteries that are in my back pocket. So it's fitting that it's a cemetery that I've come here to visit. We've seen where Eileen Valentine's body was found in episode 1. Then we've seen where she lived with her mum and dad, and now we're at the site of her grave in Sight Hill Cemetery. The first road on the right, as you come through the gates, takes you to where we see her being buried. TV and film companies love filming in this graveyard, because as well as Taggart Episode 1 and Taggart Episode 2, in the film Restless Natives, Ronnie the Clown visits the grave of William Beatty throughout the film. Recognise anyone else in this scene? Again, it's Vincent Friel from Episode 1. I had intended for this next section to tell you to go and visit Rewound and Found for more film locations. But last night, I found out the sad news that Vincent Friel had passed away at the age of 64. After talking about him so much in this video, I thought it was only fair to add a wee memorial to him and send out my condolences to his family and friends. A wee bit more cycling and yay, I'm in Springburn. Don't, don't you wish you were in Springburn? On the way here, I've so far seen a group of eight-year-olds smashing up a bus stop and then a fight break out next to the railway station. So I'm going to try and be fast and I'm going to try and be discreet at this location. I brought you here because in episode four, the butcher shop where Alex Norton worked is at the bottom of this street, just over the road from the sports centre. The sports centre wasn't here in 1983 and the butcher shop is not here now but you can still see the retaining wall that was next to the butcher's shop. This is the same location, but looking from the other direction. Now as I said, I'm not hanging about, so it's time to ride home, but I'm not quite finished with the Taggart locations just yet. My route home takes me back past Sight Hill Cemetery, back over the Sight Hill footbridge, and back into the city centre. I'm back in the banks of the Clyde, and episode 2 featured this walkway under Glasgow Bridge. Which brings us to the location that ends our tour. It's quite fitting really, as this is the location that almost ended Chief Inspector Taggart. In episode 4, Taggart drives his Sierra underneath Portland suspension bridge and then runs into the nightclub Havana Joe's. This was an actual nightclub at the time called Panama Jacks and if you look closely beyond the fence and through the graffiti you can still make out the shape of the front door and the windows as it appeared in the TV show. When I say it almost ended Taggart, it was inside Havana Joe's that Jim Taggart was shot in the back and told Peter that he didn't think he was going to make it. Tell Gina I won't make it. Don't be daft, Jim. We're nearly at the end of the video. There's only so many more jokes I can fit in. To Canada, you dunderhead. It's not a spoiler that Jim Taggart survived being shot, and he featured in the show for another 11 years. Taggart lasted without the title character until 2010, by which point it was the longest running police show in the UK. I really hope you've enjoyed this episode of Astonishing Glasgow. If you did, please help me out by hitting that like and subscribe button. If you'd like to leave a donation to help me make more of these videos, 
please hit that super thanks button and give whatever you can. I appreciate every penny. These are the people that have donated since the last episode. Check out the Astonishing Glasgow merch page and grab yourself a t-shirt, hoodie, hat, bag, sticker or more. Details of where to find that are below. And don't forget to get in touch through the comments section or via the social media pages at Facebook and Instagram. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next time in Astonishing Glasgow. This episode turned into an absolute marathon. I think we all deserve a sausage supper and a long bath. Thank you very much for watching. See you again.